All right, this is block six, um, the third set of notes, the new two-party system. This is being brought to you directly from my house. I didn't want to bother any students anymore to tape me, so I hope this works, and I hope you can hear me just fine. All right, so the new two-party system. When Andrew Jackson came to power in 1828, everybody in the United States professed to be a follower of Thomas Jefferson. We've talked about that. That Jefferson, Jeffersonianism had won politically, even though Hamilton's financial structure had stayed. Now, Jackson took the first knife, if you will, uh, to that financial structure in his destruction of the bank. But after his destruction of the bank, Jackson himself became a divisive figure in American politics. And people started to define themselves whether they agreed with Jackson or whether they disagreed with Jackson. Now, we've spoken before about Jackson's Democratic Party. It was a very diverse party. If everyone's going to be saying that, hey, I'm a Jacksonian, then that's everyone is a pretty diverse group of people. But they believed several or many important things that kind of drew them all together. Jacksonians believed in the supremacy of that common man, uh, the common farmer, laborer, mechanic, tradesman, the average, everyday working Joe, uh, we might say today, was at the heart of Jacksonian democracy. And the fact that this common person was raised up on a pedestal uh, makes that emblematic of the Jacksonian age. Suspicion of distinctions of class, uh, suspicions of large corporations, suspicion of banks. Uh, Jacksonians believed in economic freedom, economic opportunity, unrestricted by both government and um, by the restrictions of the elite class. So, no restrictions, if you will, on the rise of this common person. Political freedom for white males. We talked about how Jackson got rid of the last remaining... Um, examples of property qualifications uh, in voting, the idea that the average person is capable of holding public office. We saw that in the spoils system, uh, where anyone, uh, in exchange for the support of Jackson, a person would get a government job. Jackson supported public education on a state level. He's a, at heart, or a part of his heart at least, was Jeffersonian that Jackson did not believe in national, federal solutions to every problem. Uh, education, he felt, was important, but it should be done on the state level. That there was nothing in the Constitution saying that the federal government or that Congress should subsidize education. Uh, another example of Jackson's constitutional thought, uh, there was a bill called the Maysville Road. The Maysville Road was entirely within one state, so Jackson vetoed it because he did not feel that Congress had the right to regulate commerce inside states, only commerce interstate, between states, interstate commerce. Uh, and that federal government should be limited. But in the areas that the federal government was supreme, or the areas that the federal government had a role, the federal government had to be supreme. That the states could not ever overrule the federal government. So that's Jackson's democracy. That's Jackson's vision of America. And before long, opposition to Jackson begins to build. And the opposing groups are led, this is Henry Clay over here, kind of coalesce together around Senator Henry Clay, the great compromiser uh, from Kentucky, uh, and he called his group the National Republicans. Uh, and they provided the first opposition to Jackson. They were joined, Senator Clay was soon joined by Democrats. Now, Jackson had renamed Jefferson's party. Jefferson called his party the Republicans. Historians attached the name Democrat, Re Democrat Republicans to avoid confusion. And sort of around the time of Jackson, Jackson began referring to his party as the Democratic Party. Uh, and that is the same Democratic Party as today. It goes right back to Jefferson through Jackson onto modern times. Uh, so, they're Democrats now, and for the rest of American history, when we talk about Democrats, that's that party. It is the party of Jefferson, it's the party of Jackson, and on into the modern world. 
Democrats who disagreed with Jackson's financial positions, Democrats who supported the bank, uh, soon joined Henry Clay and his National Republicans. Extreme states writers who were angry at Jackson over the nullification crisis joined the opposition as well, became anti-Jackson. Now, they, nothing really held them together that Calhoun, the leader of the state's rights, and Clay and elite bankers didn't have anything really in common except for the fact that they hated Jackson. Uh, so it was an anti-Jackson party at first and very little united uh, this diverse group of people. They attached a name to themselves, too, before too long. They began calling themselves the Whigs, and that's W-H-I-G-S, Whigs. And they called themselves Whigs because Whigs is a word in the English tradition with a long and proud history. The Whigs uh, were the name were, was the name given to uh, the English who opposed the divine right of monarchy. The given to the English who opposed the rights of the king and supported the rights of Parliament uh, over the king. They became known as Whigs. Originally it was a term of insult, and then the Whigs, like anyone ever should when you are insulted, owned the term themselves and began calling it themselves Whigs proudly. Um, the term Whigs was chosen because Jackson was often portrayed as an all-powerful monarch, a king, who trampled the Constitution in order to get what he wanted. So, when you call yourself a Whig, you are implying that your opposition is a king. And that was the main charge that the anti-Jacksonians leveled, or one of the main charges, that the anti-Jacksonians leveled against President Jackson. So who were these new, these Whigs, this new group in American politics? Well, they're anyone involved with banking or finance, because Jackson destroyed the bank. They are Hamilton's heirs. They are the heirs of the old Federalists uh, from New England. They are the men of finance and money and banking. The elites uh, became Whigs. They did not like Jackson's coarse manners. Uh, they did not, they were kind of turned off by the rabble uh, that formed up the main supporters. The professionals that were in the country at the time, the doctors, the lawyers, ministers, college-educated people, joined the opposition, joined the Whigs. They, J Jackson himself, President Jackson, uh, was very, he was anti-intellectual. He did not have time for intellectuals, nerds, scientists, experts. Jackson did not like science. He distrusted it, and he especially distrusted the people who did the science, claiming uh, to know things of universal truth based on, you know, experiment and reason and all these things. Uh, Jackson did not like those people. They did not fit in with his mold of the primacy, of the prime place uh, for common people. Uh, in the 1830s, the, the idea for a national university had come up, and Jackson had vetoed it, both on constitutional grounds, the Constitution did not say, hey, you can have a national university, and also on the basis of it would be a, a hotbed of intellectual elite opinion um, that did not like him, and he returned the favor. So most, most of the professionals and the elites in the country joined the Whig Party. There, but the elites a party does not make. A party has to have its ordinary, average, everyday people also. And the ordinary, average, everyday people that supported the Whigs were ordinary, average, everyday people who wanted a strong federal government, like Hamilton. People who favored internal improvements in railroads and canals and interstate roads and places for of science and learning. And John Quincy Adams had proposed a national astronomy, of all things. People who were sort of into this um, supported the Whigs as well. The election of 1836. Let's call it up. Of course, we don't have a map. Not an MPA either. No map.
Let's try Wikipedia. There we go. Let's see if we can zoom this in. This is the ghetto version of U.S. history right here. Alright, let's take a quick look at the election of 1836. Ghetto version. Jackson's two terms were up in 1836. Uh, and he picked his vice president, uh, old kinderhook Martin Van Buren, from New York to succeed him. Now, there's an interesting story about Martin Van Buren. Um, his nickname was Old Kinderhook. And one of the theories out there about where the phrase OK comes from, comes from um, President Van Buren. When people were asked what president they supported, they would reply in, uh, with old Kinderhook's initials. They would say, OK. They would say, when asked who, were they, who they were supporting, they would say, oh, it's OK for me. And from that, the phrase OK came into the common use in the language. So Martin Van Buren was running for the Democrats, and the Whigs were not yet strong enough to have one person to run against uh, Van Buren and the Jacksonian Democrats, so they purposely split their ticket uh, in an attempt to throw the election to the House of Representatives. Uh, they failed. They, tr they ran William Henry Harrison from the West. They ran Hugh Lawson White, um, who was from the South and they ran Daniel Webster from New England. And they purposely tried to garner enough votes so that Van Buren would not have a majority and the election would have to go to the House. They failed, and Van Buren won re-election uh, with 170 electoral votes. I'm back. Martin Van Buren, the presidency of uh, Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren uh, was a decent man, um, not an ideologue. Uh, he was pragmatic and engaging with very good judgment. Uh, he uh, had opposed uh, the Second Bank of the United States. You couldn't be Jackson's vice president if you did not oppose the Second Bank of the United States. But he also opposed these irresponsible state banks that had taken the country um, into a more perilous financial position. He, in New York, he had actually went and created a policy sort of like the modern FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which, which, if you don't know, protects your deposits, you the average citizen. If you put your money in a bank and the bank fails, the government will cover you up to a quarter of a million dollars. Van Buren, in his native New York, had instituted a system uh, very much like that. Uh, he called it the safety fund system. Pragmatic. Uh, as a politician goes. He favored internal improvements, but wanted the states to take care of them, not the federal government. And again, favored a pragmatic approach where he would decide things not based on their ideological soundness or not based on whether it supported the party, but Van Buren would truly base things on whether or not if any individual thing was a good idea or not. Martin Van Buren suffered the fate of taking office just as the Panic of 1837 was hitting, uh, caused largely, as we saw, by Jackson's specie circular and the irresponsible uh, actions of the pet banks and the state banks. Um, a brief recovery happened, but in 1839 the price of cotton fell uh, dramatically. It caused state banks to default on their debt. It caused state, uh, states themselves to default on their debts. Loans given out by the pet banks uh, were called in and people couldn't pay them, so the banks went under. Um, investment fell, people got scared, the economy slowed down, and what you had, really, was the first major depression in American history, which lasted into the mid-1840s. Van Buren tries to deal with the crisis as best he can. Let's get a picture of Martin Van Buren right here, by the way. Oh, Martin Van Buren, where are you? Here you are. There's old Kinderhook, Martin Van Buren. We'll zoom in on him for a moment. Let's see if we can zoom a little more efficiently this time. There he is. 
Martin Van Buren. Woohoo! Try to keep this informal here. There is little Van Buren could do or knew how to do about the financial crisis. Uh, he did little. He expected that the crisis would be short, um, and eventually it would end. And eventually it did end, but it did not end until the next election cycle. And for a politician, in the election cycles are the only thing that matters. The one thing he did try to do, he called the Independent Treasury Act. Um, and what he said, the government money should not be in private banks, any banks, at all. So he had the government build these vaults uh, where all the government's money would go. And all it does, really, is it forces more specie out of banks and into these vaults where it can't be loaned. Uh, all it did, really, was hurt the economy more by taking more money out of circulation. The United States was really heading um, for an economic catastrophe. Its banking system was so catastrophic. Its banking system was such a mess. Uh, really, the only thing that saved it was the discovery of gold in California in 1849. Um, that plus European investment in railroads, so the gold from, uh, from California plus the gold from European investment really saved um, the American economy in the 1840s and 50s. And we kind of just stumbled along uh, with a very, very poor, um, primitive banking system until the Civil War fixed that. Uh, so there was little Van Buren could do, and what he did do did not work, and this decent and hardworking and equitable man um, is considered by most historians to be a colossal presidential failure. And a colossal presidential failure does nothing like excite the opposition. And the opposition Whigs were ready. And the opposition Whigs were excited. They knew that the election of 1840 was theirs for the taking. The Jacksonians and Jackson and the Jacksonian Democrats had come to power supporting a popular general and shouting the praises of the common man. And now the Whigs would do exactly the same thing. And the election of 1840 is the first truly modern election in American history. Modern in all the worst possible senses. Nobody talked about ideas. The candidates, the, excuse me, the election became a shouting match over which candidate was more like the common man. Ideas, debates, well thought out processes were nowhere to be seen. It was as far from the ratification debate as you could possibly imagine that in 50 years, Americans now were a lot more interested in yelling and shouting and screaming from their politicians than they were about reasoned argument uh, that had been a lot more in, in evidence uh, in the ratification struggle of the Constitution. The chief Whig, uh, the man who expected the nomination, was Henry Clay. But the Whigs said, we can't nominate you, Henry Clay. Everybody knows what you stand for. We have to nominate somebody who stands for absolutely nothing. And then we'll just run a popular general who stands for very, very little. And we'll just run against Van Buren. And we'll run against the bad economy. So they nominated a military hero from Ohio, William Henry Harrison. Let's find him. Here he is. You see him there? William Henry Harrison. We're just going to move. There he is. William Henry Harrison. From the great state of Ohio. That's who the Whigs know. They passed over Clay, like we said. They passed over Webster, like, they, uh, like we said, because everyone knew what they stood for, uh, and their views were too well-known and too controversial. Harrison had no strong views whatsoever. He knew he wanted to be president. That was pretty much his only view. And he seemed to... Pro and this was... This, Henry Clay was not happy. Um, he wanted to be president of the United States. But Webster seemed to 
get an understanding out of Harrison that if Harrison was elected, he would defer to Whigs in Congress. That whatever congressional Whigs wanted, President Harrison would kind of go along with. In order to balance the ticket, the Whigs nominated John Tyler, a states' rights man from Virginia, uh, and that balanced the ticket. So they had a northern man from uh, Ohio, a southern man from uh, Virginia, a national unity guy, a states' rights guy. It's a ticket that doesn't really hold well together. The only thing that, it, it, that holds it together is the fact they don't like Jackson, and they don't like Van Buren, and they both want to be, you know, that Harrison wants to be president. The campaign was something of an embarrassment um, for historians. It was based around two very, very important issues. Log cabins and hard cider. In order to show their appeal to the common man, the Whigs claimed that candidate Harrison, William Henry Harrison, had been born in a log cabin and enjoyed drinking hard cider. This obviously meant that he was a friend of the people and would be able to do whatever the people wanted. Now, Harrison's father had been a signer of the Declaration of Independence, actually, and his grandson would also be president. The man had been born in very comfortable circumstances. He had never lived in a log cabin. He was not born in a log cabin. That did not stop his supporters from claiming that he had been born in a log cabin to show that he was so average, and a supporter of the average American. He also did not particularly enjoy drinking hard cider. I mean, he enjoyed drinking as much as the next guy, but he was not a heavy drinker either. That did not stop his campaign. Log cabins and, and um, hard cider became the symbols of the campaign, and they were printed everywhere. You can see on your notes. They came up with a catchy slogan. Uh, since Harrison had been the victor of the Battle of Tippecanoe over Tecumseh, and his running, na running mate was named Tyler, they said, tip a canoe and Tyler too. And that was on the words of everybody who wanted to change in Washington. Tip a canoe and Tyler too. And they printed flyers and buttons and posters, and they had songs and rallies and cheers, and tip a canoe and Tyler too. They are going to change the country. Van Buren tried to make the candidate about the issues. Excuse me, tried to make the campaign about the issues, and nobody really listened to him. It's hard to feel bad for the Jacksonian Democrats, because they just kind of got what was coming to them. They had done this exact same thing to John Quincy Adams when Jackson had been elected, and now the Whigs just learned from them. And they ran this campaign of a non-ideological, popular general yelling about how average and common he was, how much like the people he was... Um, the Democrats tried, um, but the mood of the country was sour, the country was going through difficult economic times, people were ready for a change, and in the election of uh, 1840, William Henry Harrison won 234 electoral votes to Van Buren's 60, and you can see that on your map. Um, it was a blowout that Van Buren even lost uh, his home state of New York, uh, which is always embarrassing for a candidate, and it was not a particularly close race. So, William Henry Harrison became president, leader of the Whigs, the opposition party to Jackson, standing against what Jackson stood for. We have a new two-party system, Jackson's Democrats and the Whigs of Henry Clay and William Henry Harrison. So what will this general do upon becoming president? Well, the first thing he did was he gave a two-and-one-half-hour inauguration speech outside in the cold, in the sleet, without his hat on. He went inside. Within a day or so, he was complaining he didn't feel good. He did not get better. He took to his bed about two weeks after becoming president, and in that bed, after 30 days in office, William Henry Harrison died. By far the shortest presidential term in history. Harrison was president for exactly one month. Nowadays, we take for granted that when the president becomes the president, excuse me, when, when the president dies, the vice president automatically becomes president. Well, that had never been tried before uh, in 1840. The president had never died in office. Some people were saying 
is he is John John Tyler is the vice president we are we get that they say is he going to be acting president does he get to serve out his term do we have to have a new election what happens and after some careful reading of the Constitution and after consulting the Attorney General and some members of the Supreme Court uh, it was decided that John Tyler would be the actual president and he would serve out Harrison's complete full term but Tyler is not very much like Harrison. He's a states' rights man. He's a Jeffersonian, in a sense. Um, so the country, after it had finally elected somebody in opposition to Jackson, the man they elected in his new two-party system died 30 days after becoming president, and the United States um, would now have John Tyler as the 10th president of the United States. That's the new two-party system.